Welcome back, honors. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom. I'm actually taking place in my guest room right now because the big thing about it is I love to record my videos in here for two reasons. Because it's like the nicest like room in my apartment and stuff like that. It's really, really cute. My wife decorated it real good. And then also because it's a place where like a little somebody likes to hang out on the weekends. His name is Pierre. Hello, baby. Yes. He's very sleepy right now, and he wants to lay down. But this is the 40-pound sausage that lives in my house, okay? I love you. Yes? No cake. So the big thing about it, though, is we're going to pick up right where we left off in class, which we were talking about Mesopotamia, okay? So we talked about a lot of different stuff in class on Friday. All right, so, like, on Friday we talked about uh, different kind of, like, themes or thematic elements that all Mesopotamian city-states shared. We talked about religion, and we also talked about writing systems and cuneiform and the Epic of Gilgamesh, and we also talked about their polytheism and their architecture and their ziggurats and their rah. So, like, the thing about it, though, that we're now going to be moving into is the gifts from the individual city-states, right? What are things that must, or excuse me, not, well, later on, like, bleh, 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 bleh. let's say that again. Rewind it back. All right. Sorry. He also is sitting back up now because he keeps thinking he hears a mailman coming every 30 seconds. He wants to go bark at it. You're not very nice. Oh, oh, there's Josie. Now, look, so the big thing about it, though, also is let's try that again. We are now going to move into what the Mesopotamians did, okay? City-state to city-state different from one another. So we talked about a couple of very, very big city-states, ones that actually ended up controlling and taking over large swaths of land in a little list, right? And then we actually saw if you could actually say all of them in class, and I was very impressed because a lot of y'all actually made sure you knew them. It was Sumeria, right? So the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Assyrians, and the Neo-Babylonians. So the thing about it is we're now going to move through those each one at a time, except for a couple. Of them. We'll skip over the Hittites and the Assyrians just because we actually bring those guys up a little bit later. Uh, we bring them up later because the Hittites and the Egyptians are going to get into some wars with each other, and then we also bring it up a little bit later because the Assyrians are going to take over large swaths of land in the Fertile Crescent, kind of leading to things known as diasporas, the movements of Jewish people, and things like that during that later time when we get into the lighter part of this unit. Okay, so the gifts of each major city state, though, we have to start off with the very, very first one. We have to start off with the Sumerians, right? From the area known as Sumer, right? So the thing about it that we do know were the Sumerians, is they were kind of the people that started everything when it comes to Mesopotamia. They were the first ones to use irrigation to grow things like barley and wheat and dates and other kinds of different cash crops that the Mesopotamians are going to use not only to sustain themselves, but also to trade with other civilizations. For example, when we get to the very first Western civilization, we begin to talk about ancient Greece. The Sumerians are the ones that actually traded with the ancient Greeks for their olive oil and wine, so, and they gave them barley, grains, and other types of cereals so, um, so the actual Greeks could make things like bread because something that you need to understand ancient societies all live and die off bread okay bread is going to be the main sustenance thing the main thing that gets you through your day for the next several thousand years all right that's why literally it's such an important part of so many ancient cultures and it's also a really big reason why as well it's a part of the like the like the mass right the mass at school and stuff like that because bread is such an essential part of the diet of ancient peoples but the thing about it is the very first ones to use the irrigation systems to grow up very very well is going to be the Sumerians they're going to create the systems of dikes, dams, and canals that actually made large-scale farming in the Fertile Crescent area possible. Now, they are also going to be the very first ones to develop cuneiform, the very, very first people that are going to like actually create the system of cuneiform, use it well, and use it to document crops and actually like to make sure that they have enough surplus going in to the harsher parts of the entire winter and stuff like that is going to be that of the Sumerians, okay? Another one as well, they're gonna create the wheel and they're gonna be the very first ones to use a wheel. I know that seems kind of weird and it's like, really, you came up with the irrigation and stuff like that before the wheel? Well, first of all, we don't know necessarily when they came up with it because we don't really have that written record data and we also can't translate cuneiform, but we do know the very first people to ever use a wheel system, carts, uh, wagons, things like that, are gonna be the Sumerians as well. Now, the thing about it that's really, really cool also is that a lot of people are always concerned or curious about the idea how do we know so much about the Sumerians? They were alive so many thousands of years ago. Well, the thing about it, y'all, is we know a lot about the Sumerians for one particular reason. We have a ton of their artifacts still lying around. Lots and lots of their artifacts still lying around. Mostly due to the fact that we have found some of this thing known as the tombs of Ur. Now look, the big thing about it is Ur is a smaller Mesopotamian city-state. The Sumerians took over and actually several of their leaders and some of their nobles actually lived in this city. Now an interesting little thing about it as well is that also in the tombs of Ur, like, it's like we actually have like discovered this like city-state in general. And interestingly enough, a very famous figure from the Bible is from there. Whenever y'all get to this entire thing in Mr. Mathern's class and y'all begin to talk about the history of the church and the history of the faith and things 
things like that. Big thing that you need to bring up is the fact that, oh, Mr. Mathern, I heard in Mr. Terry's class that Abraham is from Ur. Yes, the guy, the father of all the monotheistic faiths. Abraham himself is from the city of Ur. But in the city of Ur, like the, we're also going to find these royal tombs. And the tombs actually contain tons and tons of artifacts because it was sealed off from other kind of outside, like, you know, outside tampering for so long. And in the, like, royal tombs of Ur, there was apparently one very, very famous individual that was buried inside of it, possibly a noble or a governor or some kind of other upper echelon figure. And then we even found dead bodies in it because apparently a bunch of people committed suicide and took poison and died in there. But it also inside of it, we found gold artifacts facts, relics, some of the other earliest forms of cuneiform were also stored inside of it. So the thing about it, though, also is the Sumerians, though, are eventually going to give way to another group of people that is going to be very short-lived, but still super, super important. And their names is known as the Akkadians, right? Their names is known, that's dumb. They are known as the Akkadians, right? The Akkadians are, the, are actually going to be led famously, but first of all, to be the people that actually create their first large military structure, okay? They're going to create the very, very first thing in the Fertile Crescent area, which is going to have a massive military structure, all right? They're going to have a huge army that's going to be led over by a man named Sargon the Great, right? Sargon the Great, of course, actually, like, exonified, or excuse me, personified by this mask right here, is going to be their leader and king, and is going to actually lead them in their conquests over the Sumerians, and they're going to become the ruling factor of the entire Fertile Crescent area for about a hundred years, right? Because later on, Sargon's descendants actually lose the grip on the entire area to the Babylonians. Now, they create the very, very first large-scale military. Now, these military like structures are going to be super important because military is going to become such an important thing as the progression of Western civilizations go forward because literally it just seems like the people can't go to war with one another. So led by Sargon the Great, though, he will conquer all of Sumeria, and he's going to create some of the very, very important infrastructure systems that the Mesopotamians are going to use that we are actually going to be still using today, including things like roads, service roads, trade routes, and things like that, and then also even a postal service. That is right. Literally under the Akkadians, the very, very first postal service was ever used in some of y'all are probably immediately like, well, Mr. Terry, I don't feel like the Postal Service is very good. And also, my mom gets mad at it all the time because it's always late. Blah, 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 blah. Well, look, the big thing about the Postal Service is you got to have one because you got to be able to collect taxes, right? So one of the things about the Acadians is with these roads, this infrastructure, and also now a new Postal Service, taxation, taxable collection and tax collecting became much easier, much, much, much more simpler to use. And Western civilizations are going to kind of copy and paste this entire system going forward for several hundred years. And also it was such a good thing, literally going forward. <clears throat> there we go. Got to get that out. So is that they even had envelopes and they would send letters and stuff like that. Look at this right here. This is crazy. Mesopotamia actually, or excuse me, the Akkadians created a system so good that you could literally create like envelopes out of stone. Look at that little cuneiform letter that somebody probably wrote to somebody and it's actually encapsulated inside of another little piece of stone. And we have several different pieces of these artifacts and I saw one when I was at the Vatican Museum in Rome. Like, look at that. That's so cool. It's an envelope with a little rock inside of it. That says something to you on it. What if it says like, happy birthday? You smell like cheese or something like that. I don't know, but it's really, really cool that they actually are going to create this postal service that's going to be used very, very efficiently for hundreds and hundreds of years. So going into it, though, also, they were super short-lived, though. However, the later on Mesopotamians that actually took them over are going to use this postal service and these roads very, very well. And now the thing about it, though, is they are super short and lived, but they fell to invading tribes. Mainly, we're talking about these people known as the Babylonians, right? Now, the Babylonians you probably heard of before. Speaking of religion class, Babylon is also referred to sometimes as the big meanies that nobody likes. So, like, the thing about it is Hebrews were heavily persecuted by Babylonians for some quite uh, quite long period of time. There's also this thing known as the Babylonian captivity, which actually occurred to the Hebrews during uh, the Old Testament period of time. I don't know. I'd have to ask Mr. Mathern. He's the know-all when it comes to things like that. But going into it, though, they conquered the entire Fertile Crescent region, the Babylonians did, and they're going to begin to set up a very, very interesting system of of government. Now, the thing about their system of government is going to mostly be ran by their king, and their very, very famous king is a man by the name of King Hammurabi, right? Hammurabi. Now, some of y'all have probably heard of Hammurabi before. King Hammurabi was extremely important because in the part of his consolidation of all these different areas and all these different places in the Fertile Crescent area, he's going to begin to draw on all the different cultures themselves. He's going to take certain things from the Sumerians and take certain things from the Akkadians and take certain things from the people of the city of Ur. And he's going to combine all of them to try and create a more official and a more uh, efficient governmental structure that he can use to rule over the entire area. Now, in this process, as 
he conquered neighbors, neighboring city states, he improved a lot of the irrigation systems and established a booming economy based on grain, right? Literally, we talked about this earlier, right? What did you measure your entire like wealth in? Well, the thing about it is, is Hammurabi created a system where there was a concrete exchange system based on the amounts of grain and what they were worth. And so also the other big thing about it, though, as well, is he wanted to be able to administer over this entire area with a system of law that would actually be a little bit more efficient and could actually keep people in line and he could keep his empire for as long as possible. And he creates the very first code of law that Western civilizations have ever seen, and it's known as Hammurabi's Code. Right now, Hammurabi's Code is really, really important because the entire premise is that it's based off of is an eye for an eye, right? Something about a very simple code of law during this time period, as you would think, is that just being like, oh, well, if he does it to me, then I will then do it back onto them, right? So the basically the entire thing goes like, oh, well, if one person stabs out my eye, I get to stab out that other person's eye. If he slaps me, I get to slap him back. And that's also another thing about it, is this is not the best system in the world. Hence why in the Bible it actually says as well, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind, right? So now going into it also though, it is 282 laws as well. So the same thing about it is like, yes, it's a simple premise of this eye for an eye concept established by King Amurabi, but the 282 laws are from all over Mesopotamia, okay? They're from all over every single city state, and they contributed their laws to this giant like slab of like it's literally kept on a giant tablet for everyone to see i think it's like somewhere of like eight feet tall or something like that it's absolutely massive and it was done like that so it could be posted somewhere in public so then everybody could actually go and see it now how tall is hammurabi's code uh oh here we go uh so hammurabi's code is approximately seven foot four inches tall and the laws are all written in cuneiform and we still have it this is actually the top of it the headpiece on the Hammurabi's code of him actually administering the laws of the land right now the thing about it though also is punishment was meant to fit the crime the element of an eye for an eye is meant to be the idea of that actually whatever you did can then be done back onto the person now the thing about it though is, is that's always not going to be the case let's say hypothetically you cause a certain amount of property damage you are then supposed to pay the person back for that amount of property damage but the thing about it that is also really really important is you got to ask yourself is was it fair and the answer is a big fat no all right so it actually wasn't a great system of law some of y'all are probably thinking to yourself well, I was like well you know if i'm a painter or something like that and i cause damage to someone's home i should have to pay for the damage to that home that makes complete sense well the thing about it though also is you got to understand that there are a lot of other weird laws in there for example the laws were not fair to women whatsoever there's a law in hammurabi's code somewhere that actually says that if a barmaid does not like actually do her job effectively, she could have rocks tied to her feet and she could be thrown in the river. There's another one as well that says if somebody does not take care of their dike or dam efficiently enough in the irrigatable system, then they can also possibly be executed or have a part of their body removed, right? That is really, really aggressive. Like, that's just taking care of a dam. That's like, doesn't feel like I need to have, like, my hand cut off. Speaking of your hand being cut off, another fun little law in Hammurabi's Code says that if a child slaps their father, that their hands will be cut off. That is ridiculous, right? And Another interesting one as well, this is really important, okay? Let's say, hypothetically speaking, that I'm a poor person doing a job, right? I'm a poor person doing a job and I have my hammer right here and I'm like going like this, right? And then I accidentally just like fling this hammer off and I hit Pierre back there, but Pierre's super wealthy in like in Mesopotamia, right? He is the person that was buried in the Temple of Ur and he has all this money. Well, if I hit him with my hammer on accident and I like hit one of his eyes out, the thing about it is he's going to come up to me and be like, hey, I got to take one of your eyes now because you hit mine out, okay? That's really, really unfair because the thing about it is, is let's say it was the other way around. Around. Let's say Pierre was super, super rich, and he did something wrong and hurt me. He can just pay me for it, right? So, like, do you see what I'm talking about? It's not actually fair, because it's also not fair class to class. The wealthier, like, echelons of society could simply pay their way out of their crimes if they actually felt like it, right? So it's not the most fair thing on the planet, but it did set up an early law system that is going to be, like, kind of transcend time for a really long period of time. Now, the Assyrians are going to then take over the Babylonians and rouse them out, the Assyrians being a very, very large military structured society that comes out of the base of the Zagros Mountains, which is actually right around the border of Iran. Well, the thing about it, though, is, is that this warrior culture is going to be very important, but we're not going to talk about them right now. We're actually going to talk about them a little bit later, okay? We're going to talk about them a little bit later because it's actually, we want to talk about the Hebrew first and we talk about, I want to talk about how the Assyrians later on caused this thing known as a massive diaspora all right so and we're also going to talk about them a little bit too just because their entire society is so intense and they kind of deserve their own prezi right now then there's this last group of people known as the neo-babylonians right because after the Assyrians took over the Babylonians they actually took them hostage and then actually like forced them to do a lot of their different biddings and a lot of their different work and they actually managed to make them really really upset and then under
underneath this warlord known as Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so like he is actually going to consolidate all of the Babylonian tribes together, and he's going to consolidate all of the other city states together into a massive army that will rise up against the oppressive rule of the Assyrians, and they will literally force them out. Right now, the thing about it though that's important to notice in this entire process is that Mesopotamia seems to be led by a lot of warlords. Right. Well, the thing about it that word right there, warlord, is very important. Because the thing about it is, Hammurabi was a warlord. He controlled a huge army. Sargon the Great, warlord, controlled a huge army, okay? So Nebuchadnezzar is the exact same way. But he will actually control this army and rouse the Assyrians out and create something very, very famous known as the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And what I want you to do in class when I see y'all actually on Tuesday, I want y'all to ask me about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And I'm going to tell you a story about Nebuchadnezzar and what he did for his wife that will actually make it so any man that tries to do anything for you will seem crusty by comparison. All right. But the big thing about those, we'll talk about that on Tuesday. I'll see y'all soon. I hope y'all enjoyed this flip and I'll talk to y'all soon. If y'all need anything at all over the weekend, let me know. Send me an email. But have a great time. All right. Relax and I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.